Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man who knows that at any moment, a $20 scratch-off could dramatically change his life. Here is the captain. Yeah, flicky flicky on my way to thousands and thousands of dollars. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week I am chair dancing because we are featuring a beer by one of my absolute favorite producers of beer. Today we are drinking Hazy Heights IPA Tropical Smooth. This is by the Brewmasters over at Highland Brewing Company in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. This baby is plump with hazy notes, tropical fruits like pineapple and mango, which smooth out the bitterness of this IPA which features five different kinds of hops. 7.5% ABV, available in cans and kegs, garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here is a shout out to some of our garage friends who I hope are listening in and chair dancing to the captain's latest music creation. First up, a big cheers to Kimberly in Lewis Center, Ohio. A big shout out to Wendy in Star, Idaho. Next up, here's a cheers to Brandy from Pittsburgh, PA. And a big shout out to Ann in Tucson, Arizona. Next up, we have a cheers to Thomas in Chapin, South Carolina. And last but certainly not least, we have Ryan in Boise, Idaho. Everyone we just mentioned, well, they went to our website, which is truecrimegarage.com. Clicked on the little tip button, the donate button, the beer fund button button and helped us out with this week's beer run and for that we thank you yeah b-w-e-w-r-u-n beer run if you need more true crime garage for your earballs do it right now stop what you're doing because i'm about to ruin the true crime podcast that you're used to check out our show called off the record and you can do so at truecrimegarage.com there's a link right there colonel that's enough of the beers all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Princess Doe was found July 15, 1982, in Blairstown, New Jersey. She was given the name of Princess, so she would not be just another Jane Doe. Next week will be 40 years since her body was discovered, and there are so many out there that still hope and pray that one day her headstone will bear her real name. After the gruesome discovery of her body, and as time marched on in 1982, Princess Doe remained unclaimed in the morgue for six months. The good people of Blairstown pulled together their financial resources for a proper burial for the girl. Today, she lies in eternal rest in the Cedar Ridge Cemetery, steps away from where her half-clothed body was found down a wooded embankment on that muggy summer day. To this day, Princess Doe's true identity still remains unknown. Her name forever imprinted in cyberspace on the Warren County Prosecutor's Office Cold Cases website. The headstone placed at her current resting spot was paid for by local donated funds. The headstone simply reads, Princess Doe, missing from home, dead among strangers, remembered by all, born question mark, found July 15, 1982. This is True Crime Garage. (laughs) 
There are several law enforcement agencies involved in the investigation into figuring out who Princess Doe is, who Princess Doe was, and who is the perpetrator of her murder. I will read directly from the prosecutor's website so that we don't misconstrue any of the facts here. And from the Warren County Prosecutor's website, it states, Unidentified female known as Princess Doe. A deceased female was found on July 15, 1982 in Warren County, New Jersey. Her body was found behind Cedar Ridge Cemetery on Highway 94, located in Blairstown. The female had been deceased for less than a week prior to being found. She is 15 to 20 years old. She was petite, standing approximately 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighing 110 pounds. Now keep in mind, those are both approximate numbers on the weight and the height. Her left earlobe was double pierced, but no earrings were found. It is unknown if her right ear was pierced or not. The female had been treated by a dentist at one point in her life as a few dental fillings were observed in her teeth. She was found wearing a red V-neck short sleeve shirt and a long red wrap-around skirt that had peacocks pictured around the lower hem border. She was also wearing a gold chain necklace that had white beads along the chain and an ornate cross pendant. Images of the skirt and cross are featured on the prosecutor's website, and we will put that on our social media. The thing that we need to point out here too, Captain, is that facial reconstruction was completed by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children forensic artist and depicts what the female or Princess Doe may have looked like in life. So we have those sketches, we have those artist renderings of what they believe Princess Doe may have looked like. Another interesting thing is that she had red nail polish on her right hand only and that she had no known surgical scars or distinguished birthmarks or tattoos. Well, at least this is what we know of her body. We don't know if there were scars or any marks on her face because she was so badly beaten in the face. I want to cite a wonderful story that was put together by a Natasha Mullins on the website medium.com. And Natasha titled her article about the Princess Doe case. She titled it The Woman Who Lies Dead Among Strangers. It's a really good read. I recommend that everybody check that out on medium.com. I'll read a portion of it here, which gives a little more description on the discovery of the body of the remains. And this is titled a brutal discovery, which it exactly, that's exactly what it was. And it reads Cedar Ridge cemetery is a small cemetery nestled in the forest of Blairstown, New Jersey off of highway 94. Blairstown was a farming community home to just over 5,000 permanent residents in 1982 and was a quiet little town without many disturbances. On July 15, 1982, George Kreese, a grave digger for Cedar Ridge Cemetery, was walking through a wooded area towards the rear of the cemetery when he came across a horrific discovery. Lying face up on the bank of a creek bed was the decomposing body of a young woman. She was wearing a red t-shirt, and a red peasant skirt was folded across her legs. Her face had been bludgeoned to the point that it was unrecognizable, and a gold cross necklace was tangled in her hair. Kreese notified the police immediately, and an investigation began. No identifying possessions were found on the body of the woman, and because of how she was found, the case was immediately considered a homicide. An autopsy concluded that she had died of blunt force trauma to her head, but the weapon used could not be determined. She was found without undergarments, but no evidence of sexual assault could be confirmed because of the state of the decomposition. So the killer, unfortunately, did not leave any collectible DNA behind at the crime scene. There was no evidence of drugs in Jane Doe's system, but the medical examiner initially reported that there was alcohol in her system. It was later discovered that decomposition had made her blood ferment, which made it impossible to determine if she was intoxicated 
at the time of her death. However, it was clear that she wasn't incapacitated during the attack because there were defensive wounds to her arms and hands. She had fought back against whoever attacked her. It was initially estimated that Jane Doe, later named Princess Doe, had been in the graveyard for two weeks, but later investigators have changed this number to just a few days. I guess the moist air around the creek likely sped up the decomposition and as well as the hot, muggy days, making it appear as though she had been there for a longer period of time. What we have stated here in this article, Captain, is that July 11, July 11th is the approximate date of Princess Doe's death, although it is uncertain as to what the exact day is. The other thing that complicates this thing of coming up with the time of death or the date of death here for Princess Doe is the article points out that moist air around the creek, the location of the cemetery where she's found, plus it's hot, muggy days, it's July. This all kinds of speeds up the process, the decomposition process. So while we know that that would speed it up, it gets difficult to even determine when she was placed there. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how much of the decomposition was actually sped up in her situation. I mean, we could be talking about any number of situations going on here. It's a real mystery. And, And unfortunately there's not a whole lot of breadcrumbs to lead us anywhere here in this case. I mean, we could be talking about, think about what we spent so much time talking about here in the garage recently, the, America's highway serial killers. Some of these victims were transported hundreds of miles, if not a thousand miles away from where they were abducted. We don't know where she was killed, but we do have investigators who have been on the record saying, we believe she was killed elsewhere and then eventually placed in the cemetery where she was found. Well, because it was such a remote location too we don't know if she was found within a day or so of being dumped there or a a week or more right and so i i think that i would be hesitant to put july 11 as the approximate date of death i think that it's interesting that they give us one they provide us with one but i would if that were my job i would not be wanting to put my stamp on that i think there's too many factors and variables to consider when trying to come up with that, that window. And again, I keep going back to our America highway serial killer episodes and thinking she's found right off of highway 94. There's a chance that that's not a coincidence that somebody drove this person, drove this victim, killed them elsewhere days before, and then transported them and and placed her there where she was ultimately found. Well, the other problem in this case is going to be because she was so badly beaten in the face that they're not able to figure out what her eye color would be. So another identifier that we just don't have the information for. And weirdly enough, man, we have a situation here where she's found in a cemetery and then later buried in this same cemetery. So the the townspeople of the good people of Blairstown, New Jersey, they pulled together their funds and they decided to give her a proper burial with a headstone. But it, to me, it's a little creepy. She's being found in this cemetery and then later buried there as well. I'm guessing here, Captain, that there, I don't know what this creek is like in this location. It's likely that it's not big enough or powerful enough for her to have been deposited by the creek, you know, that she was dumped in a, in a larger body of water or And somehow the water carried her here. It doesn't seem like any of the investigators believe that to be a scenario worth considering. So I'm going to have to go off of the fact that they've never mentioned that. Plus there would, there should be more evidence of her being in a river or being in water for a considerable amount of time before she's found in this location. One item of concern to me, and this would be very helpful to our little armchair investigation here, Captain, our little garage investigation, if you will. I would like to know from this George Kreese, and I hope that I'm saying his name correctly, he's a grave digger, a caretaker for this Cedar Ridge Cemetery. He's the one that found her body on July 15th, 1982. I would like to know from him if he could tell us 
when he believed the last time he was in that exact location of the cemetery, right? Because then we could probably narrow it down a little bit better as to when she was placed there. And maybe that's information that the medical examiner has and the investigators have, and they are taking that into consideration when they provide us with this date of approximate death of July 11. And if you look at the Cedar Ridge Cemetery on a map, an aerial view of the cemetery will show you that the location where she is found is is rather on the fringes of the cemetery itself. Like I wouldn't even consider that to be, it's probably belongs to the cemetery, but it's so close to the Creek and in, in the start of this wooded area that I would like to know, you know, if George could recall one, what days of the week is he there? Is he there by appointment only? It doesn't sound to me like this is a job that he's there Monday through Friday every week but also take into factor, when were you in this location of the cemetery? Because her body's found in a spot where you could be there, you could be working, you could be there visiting a past family member and not see. It wouldn't be obvious that there was a body there. It was somewhat concealed to concealed from state route 94 anyway. And there's several reconstruction images. The, the one that's in color, by the NCMEC, to me, she looks like Kat Von D. Remember that tattoo artist that had a show, a tattoo show? She, <laughs> I, do, I do not. <laughs> Kat Von D, she also was famously uh, dated Nikki Six. I think she also dated um, Jesse James. So... But, but looks very similar to to this uh, artist rendering. And there are so many different agencies, as we pointed out earlier, that have been involved at times with this investigation. I've been told that the proper people to contact, should you have any information, would be the New Jersey State Police. But we also reference the Warren County Prosecutor's Office. And Nick Meck, they've worked with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as well. And then we have the Doe Network. So there's a lot of information on this case, even though we don't know who she was or have very little clue as to who she could have been. But I do want to point out that depending on which outlet you get your news from or your information from, I should say, the information is a little different on each of these websites. So if we're looking at princessdoe.org, which is a very comprehensive right. website, it's it's substantial. There's a lot of stuff going on there, a lot of good information. I don't know when the last time it was updated. It looks like it may have been a couple years since it was last updated. But on that website, we get a little bit of different information that we want to point out because the best chance of figuring out who she was would be to crowdsource this thing. And this is something that they've been trying to do since the eighties to crowdsource this, to figure out who she could have been. And on the princess doe.org site, it says the victim was found with red nail polish on the right hand only as the captain pointed out. But here it says both ears were pierced where on the Warren County website, it states that they could not determine this says both ears were pierced the left ear twice. So some some differing information here. Well, the information I found is that they found two earrings in her left ear. And then they go on to state this seems to be pretty hardcore fact here, uh, and everybody seems to be agreeing on this information. No known surgical scars, birthmarks, or tattoos were found on her person. Scars or marks on the head face area would not be known due to the condition of the body. Mm -hmm. It also goes on to state that the, the front two teeth are slightly darker than the other teeth. Dental records are available for comparison. So that's good. They have some dental records, which has come to help clear other potential persons that could be Princess Doe that yeah. they've determined based off of dental records that the person is not princess doe well another identifying factor is that this victim has never 
given birth nor been pregnant. So she wasn't pregnant at the time and, and she's never given birth before. So this is when they start trying to age her and that's they're putting her between you know 14 to 18 years old. Yeah, that varies again by website. I've seen 14 to 18. That seems to be the majority consensus. But I've also seen 15 to 20 on other websites. I think just to play it safe, let's say 14 to 20 here based off of everybody's speculation. What's really frustrating to me, again, is these images. You can find a lot of these if you just Google search Princess Doe online. But to me, a lot of the images just look like completely different people. So it kind of throws you, it'd be really hard to compare and contrast, you know, a photograph of somebody with these drawings. Well, and the other thing that we need to keep in mind, and I want everybody to to remember this at all times, when you're when you're thinking of possible theories, when we're going through some other situations here, trying to fill in the blanks. Keep in mind, no one has come forward to identify her or to claim her. That's a big part of this mystery. And to me, I think that that is what likely holds the key, the answer to this mystery. But let's go through some of the timeline here. And this is based off of the timeline from princessdoe.org. July 15th, 1982 is when the unidentified body is found, who she would later be known as Princess Doe. She's laid to rest six months later. So January 22nd, 1983 is when she is laid to rest in a grave not far from the location where her body was originally discovered at the Cedar Ridge Cemetery. Now, she's named Princess Doe by the investigators and by the good people of Blairstown, New Jersey, because they didn't want her to just be another Jane Doe. So this is a way to distinguish her from other Jane Doe's. Part of that being her young age. You know, they believe that she could possibly be a child. We said it earlier, as young as 14, maybe as old as 20. Right. But she was also somebody that was in good health and well taken care of or took care of herself leading up to her death. So this wasn't somebody that was malnourished or uh, never been to the dentist or anything like that some situations that we have covered in other cases. In 1983, HBO airs a special about unidentified human remains and features the Princess Doe case. This is also the same year when Princess Doe becomes the first unidentified person case entered into the NCIC computer database by the FBI. The next month in July of 83, is when we have the unveiling of a lifelike bust of Princess Doe based off of the interpretations of the remains. So as the captain pointed out, over the years, we will have different sketches, different computer composites of the victim, and also we have this lifelike bust that is put together. Now, in 1985, something really interesting happens in this case, and and something that, that really, I think, still... We sit here and we're we're 40 years later. We're one week from being 40 years to the date of when Princess Doe was found. But this is something that also needs cleared up, even though it took place in 1985. So starting in 1985, investigators in New Jersey became convinced that Princess Doe was Diane Dye, a teenager who went missing from San Jose, California in 1979. So Diane Dye ran away from home. There were problems at home and she decided to take off. Now, they are believing that three years later, she's found unidentified, beat to death, bludgeoned to death in New Jersey, and she could be Princess Doe. Now, Diane Dye was 13 at the time of her disappearance, so she would have fallen kind of perfectly into that age range and the height and weight range of Princess Doe. So this was a bit of a debate, right? We had the Dye family that says, no, we don't believe that that Princess Doe is our missing little girl. We believe that she's probably still alive and well and just doesn't want to come home. We don't believe or have any reason to suspect that she made it all the way to New Jersey. 
But see, then you have to argue what we were just talking about earlier. This is right next to Highway 94. Right. Is it a possibility that she was killed hundreds of miles away, that she didn't make her own way to New Jersey? The person responsible for her murder made her way to New Jersey. My big issue with this whole concept, though, is that Diane Dye's family doesn't believe that Princess Doe is her. Yes, and there was, as said, a lot of debate. There was not just debate between the Dye family and law enforcement. There was debate within law enforcement itself. Well, law enforcement made an announcement publicly. I mean, I I think that's very irresponsible. Well, right, and... (laughs) We should point out that that was one person decided to do that, that kind of went one, off on their own. Yeah, one dumbass. Without permission, without proper evidence, without anything kind of sealing the deal here. Because what we would later learn in 2003, they were able to make a DNA comparison from the Dye family to Princess Doe, and it was determined that the two were completely unrelated. Right. So no chance that Diane Dye is Princess Doe. What what boggles my mind is that that was left open-ended for so long, from 1985 to 2003, before they could determine that it was, in fact, not Diane Dye. And as you stated, Captain, some someone in law enforcement says publicly that Princess Doe was Diane Dye, it still remains to this day that there are a lot of people out here and out there that once knew of this case and believed that at least the identity portion of it is solved and still believe that Princess Doe is or was Diane Dye. And we're here to tell you that is not the case at all. This, these are scientific facts that prove that Diane Dye is not Princess Doe. are back can't wait to head to nash vegas <laughs> yes we will be in nashville this weekend at the wonderful fat bottom brewing company yes drinking beers shaking hands Smacking talking babies. to the people mm-hmm. fun times a real quick thing too if you want to check out that missing the hbo documentary fascinating information on this case but also on the johnny gosh case Now that we've cleared up the whole Diane Dye angle of this investigation, let's jump back in time two years prior to 1983. This is when police released photos of the clothing that Princess Doe was wearing at the time of her death uh, and that she was found still wearing when her body was discovered. This is because they believe that the clothing was somewhat unique and hoping that somebody would recognize the clothing and then come forward with information about who Princess Doe could have been. Now, we should also point out that initially, and this makes sense, anybody that's reviewed any murder case will know that initially the Blairstown police, they believed that it was going to be a local girl when she was first discovered. But then very quickly after a couple of days of nobody coming forward to identify her, now they start going, well... We're going to have to expand our our thoughts and considerations here on who this could be. It could be somebody from a nearby town, nearby city, or even out of state. I wish that they would have, I understand holding on to this information. I understand not wanting to release it until you feel like you have to. But I also look on these things with hindsight and I say, I think that you waited too long. You know, we we do in this case have people coming forward saying, oh, that clothing, well, that that reminds me of something. Here's some information for you. But I'm wondering what kind of information and how much better could the information have been had you released these photographs earlier? You know, people forget stuff. Things get lost in people's memories. Things get lost in time. 
But they do have people that come forward after they release the photos of this clothing that Princess Doe was wearing. One of the witnesses claimed that she had seen a woman, the woman, Princess Doe, at a store near the cemetery. Right. Another set of witnesses confirm this, saying that they had seen a woman at a grocery store two days before the murder. So I'm, I'm guessing this is before July 11th, 1982. They're saying that she was wearing her hair in a bun at the time and reportedly had a stoic expression. Mm, like him, GK. Unfortunately, none of these witnesses said that they spoke with the woman, but they did. They were all certain that it was Princess Doe that they had seen based off of this unique clothing. Now, another witness revealed that she had seen very similar clothing to what Jane Doe, Princess Doe, was wearing in a clothing store on Long Island. The witness was certain that her clothing had been bought in Long Island, and so police began investigating disappearances in that area. They also checked school records for a girl matching the Princess Doe's description, but no further leads were found. There were some eyewitnesses that believe that Princess Doe was working at a motel. Yes, one of these witnesses state that this was a motel near Blairstown, New mm -hmm. Jersey. This witness said that they actually spoke to the woman and said that they were told by her that she was a runaway from Florida and that her father was a dentist and that she was looking for work. And that she's also anti-dentite. Well, and then we have others that come forward from various motels over in New York, also in New Jersey and in Maryland, that are coming forward saying that we think that we saw her working at motel over there. If, in fact, this was Princess Doe, it sounds to me, Captain, like she must have been living under some different aliases at the time because this information, while we only have bits and pieces of it, I'm sure law enforcement have a significant amount more, and they've not been able to tie this information to an identification of Princess Doe. Yeah, we don't know for sure if it was a hotel, motel, holiday inn. Well, so it wasn't like there was no press or nobody talking about this case, but it had its ebbs and flows. But we're going to have some significant break or at least some significant information in this case 17 years later in 1999. Yeah, so this is when we have an arrest that, that would seemingly be unrelated to our case, and the arrest is of a Donna Crinlaw. And so she is arrested for fraud. She's committing fraud, and she's a bit of a career criminal. Well, her husband, Arthur, who's a few years older than her, is a bit of a career criminal as well. Now, from my understanding here, Captain Donna was picked up in California, I believe, but was originally from New Jersey or from the New Jersey area. And she's stating that they had committed some crimes in that area before she left and was committing fraud in California. And they were running, I say they, her and her husband, according to Donna, were running a, a sex trafficking operation or a sex ring where they had working girls, sex workers, that were either employed by them or forced into working for them. It's a little unclear, and I think you'll understand why once we start going through some of this information. But Donna is telling law enforcement that she believes that her husband is the one that killed Princess Doe, that was responsible for her murder, stating that... He was a shit princess. At the time of her arrest, she's stating that the couple was angered when the woman now known as Princess Doe refused to work for them as a prostitute. And she said that her husband left with the girl and didn't come back with her. Now, why would she suspect that he had killed her? Well, because she had witnessed or been a part of her husband, Arthur, killing two other girls. And now these other victims, one is known as Linda. But again, that's Linda with quotation marks. So they don't know that Linda was her actual first name. And their other victim is believed to be Suffolk County Jane Doe. So let's point out something here, Captain, that's rather obvious. First off, 
we have this couple that confesses. First, the wife confesses, and then the husband confesses to being the, the perpetrator of the murder of Princess Doe. This is going to be highly debated amongst law enforcement. What is in their favor for them telling the truth in this situation would be that their other victims still remain unidentified. They were unidentified at the time that they were found. Right. And the other victims share similar injuries that we have with Princess Doe. So that is in their favor of them telling the truth. However, we have investigators who are on the record that state that they don't believe that the Crin laws killed Princess Doe. Based off of the confession that they received, it, it doesn't align with the facts of the case, the facts that they know about the case. The other thing, too, that I want to point out here as well is if our Princess Doe was killed by a stranger or somebody that wanted to harm her, what I would suspect, I'm not saying it would have to happen or be 100%, but I would suspect that somebody that knew her, that loved her, or even once knew her or once loved her would have come forward by now and said, hey, I think that that is my missing daughter or my missing niece or my missing right sister anybody like that i think would have come forward and because we have no one coming forward to claim princess doe as being somebody to me where i think the suspicion lies is that very likely somebody that was very close to her is responsible for her murder and we've seen this with some other cases that we've reviewed here in the garage where you get somebody that's estranged from their family and they're killed by a husband or a boyfriend or a fiance right? and placed out somewhere. If they're not identified, that these family members aren't coming forward. She may have already been estranged from her family, maybe even a runaway. Yeah, or running from an abusive situation. But we've reviewed plenty of cases where a husband, boyfriend, or fiance who lives states away from the victim's family will even contact the victim's family at some point, maybe months later and say, yeah, yeah, she, uh, she took off. She started running around on me and she took off last time I, I was aware she was in Maryland or she was in Michigan and they start throwing out these different States of where this person could be. Now I am in agreement with the speculation against the Crin laws, Arthur and Donna, because the, the injuries to their other victims are, damn near spot on to what we have with princess doe. But again, we have investigators saying that they don't know the facts of the case. Their confessions don't align with the facts of the case. Their confessions only align with the publicly known knowledge, the publicly known information that has been released in her case. And keep in mind too, I think with princess doe, we're probably talking about the likelihood of some kind of sexual assault is I would put it on the high probability end of the spectrum here of our investigation based off of the fact that she's not found with any undergarments on her person, even though they could not determine that because of the decomposition. I think that that is probably the case and probably the situation here. But again, difficult thing here is because some people confess to crimes they don't commit and they have other victims that they don't have the identities for. So it's possible that this guy did kill somebody in the cemetery. It's just not Princess Doe. It's possible the Crinlaws killed more than just the two people that they are. Donna Crinlaw is out. Last time I checked, she was st- she's out on the street. She's a free woman at this point. But the Arthur Crinlaw remains in prison to this day. I'm guessing based off of the two murders that he's locked up for that it's very likely that he has committed more murders. And I think where we probably have some disconnect could be that Donna Crinlaw, the wife could be confusing princess Doe with another woman who her husband killed. I think with his confession, the problem becomes, you know, did he kill some other girl somewhere in a cemetery Again, the investigators are stating that they do not believe that she was killed in the cemetery. They believe she was killed elsewhere and then placed there. And then on top of that, we have him saying that I killed her and and placed her in that Blairstown cemetery. So 
it would be difficult to believe that that he's confusing one victim with another here when we have the specificity of his statements of that Blairstown cemetery. Interestingly enough, it's believed that it was the potential fame that they might have been seeking with being connected to the Princess Doe case. That we already have a situation where they've murdered, where he's going to be locked up for at least two homicides, and their homicides are somewhat similar to what they've read coming out of New Jersey, and that if he's going to be locked up for two anyway, he might as well get some fame and notoriety from being connected to what is a famous victim with this Princess Doe. Yeah, it's sad when these shitbags will confess to a crime that they might have had nothing to do with. Just so it's a, it's almost like they're getting a trophy and look at me, look at me, give me attention. Now, some of the identifiers or possible identifiers on Princess Doe are really interesting to me. I'm wondering here, like with the fingernail polish on one hand but not on the other hand. Right. Is this something that was deliberate? You know, I've heard it suggested that, well, maybe the, maybe the killer put nail polish on one hand for whatever weird reason, or maybe she removed nail polish. But I know several women that will purposely wear nail polish that doesn't match. You know, maybe the, the toenails are done different than the fingernails, or they'll do multiple colors on different fingernails. And so I wonder if it was just simply a style thing for this young woman that she preferred to paint only one hand if that was something that she commonly did. That would be a little unique. That would be a way to potentially identify her. If anybody was friends with with a girl at one time that, that was known to have done that, only paint one hand. Well, we know the location that she was found. I think this is definitely a case that if the true crime community got behind and, and shared her picture enough, that maybe we could could get somebody to come forward and say that that was my sister or that was my cousin or, or, or something. Well, and we talk about possible identifiers and I know we've ruled out the Diane Dye connection here, but what's weird to me, man, if you look at the Diane Dye picture and one of the pictures that was generated by Nick Mech, the national center for missing and exploited children, of Princess Doe, they're eerily similar. They're eerily similar. So I can see why somebody started to put that together. But again, we know that to be not the case. But you think with the advancements in technology for DNA that we'd be able to at least link this Princess Doe back to a family. Right. And you wonder if that's how we're going to end up solving this thing. Because again, I really think that I think that her not being, all right, she's not connected to any missing person. If she was, we would be having a whole different conversation. There is a chance that whoever she was, she was actually reported to be missing. But on the flip side of that coin, there's also the possibility that she's never been reported missing to anyone. And therefore, if that ends up being the case, I would have to strongly suspect the person closest to her, that being a father, a mother, a brother, a, a, a husband, a boyfriend, a fiance, Fancy. the person closest to her is probably responsible for, I agree. for her murder would be my belief. Now, there is some interesting things here, though, still and some potential leads with this isotope testing. And we've seen this in some other cases in the barrel doe cases that we've talked about where they do testing on the remains and based off of chemicals and other sorts of things they can determine or take an educated guess as to where the person may have lived for an extended period of time right and when they do the isotope testing on princess doe what they come up with is that she likely lived for a considerable amount of time in the state of arizona So that information that they come up with actually puts her in multiple states, but with them saying that the the strongly most suspected state would be that she lived for an extended period of time in Arizona. The other thing, though, too, is I don't think we can discount these possible sightings of her living in the area. 
right? We have multiple witnesses that come forward after seeing the clothing saying that, oh, I spoke with a, a, a young woman that worked at a motel that worked in the New Jersey area, New York area. Ocean City is strongly mentioned. So is Long Island. And those locations are really interesting to me, too, for several reasons. One, part of the Crin Law's confession states that they meet this woman that wanted some work. And so they're going to try to make her a sex worker. And she threatens to rat them out to police. And that is what pissed off Arthur to the point that he kills this young woman. The thing, the thing that's interesting to me about the Crin Law confession, though, is that it does coincide with some of these possible eyewitnesses who said that they saw and spoke with somebody leading up to the discovery of Princess Doe, that they may have spoke to Princess Doe. So that that story kind of goes along with it. Now, the strong suspicions to this day, Captain, are that the Crinlaws were not involved in Princess Doe's murder. Right. That Princess Doe likely lived for a considerable amount of time in the state of Arizona Mm -hmm. may have been a runaway from the state of Florida. And her father may have been a dentist all based off of these eyewitness statements and some information that they've collected over the years. But we have law enforcement who are on record saying we don't believe the Crinlaw's confession. However, we believe, and we have reason to believe that Princess Doe may have lived or worked on Long Island in New York, which does go along with part of Crinlaw's confession. But again, law enforcement stating everything in Crinlaw's confession is based off of public knowledge, public information, stuff they could have read in the newspapers. What is weird to me here, Captain, is 1982. You're weird to me. Still unidentified. Right. Is this, I like the idea of linking this to somebody else, right? Like someone like Crinlaw, who's killed other people in similar fashions and disposed of the bodies in similar manners. I like connecting it to somebody else. I also, I I cannot shake the idea that it could be a trucker who was traveling the region or even cross country. And that is the reason why we have, we've got a disconnect between linking victim to who she actually was, right. the unidentified remains to the missing person. I think that's a strong possibility. The other thing that keeps nagging at me. Your mother. Is the Long Island serial killer. Yes. We have Long Island serial killer victims that are still unidentified to this day. The way that the remains were found in the Long Island case would suggest that they were killed, these victims were killed in a, in a manner other than bludgeoned to death. From everything I've read, that would be the suspicion. I don't think they've come right out and said how exactly how these victims were killed. But I find it interesting that this happens in 82. We still have some un- unidentified persons in the Lisk case, the Long Island serial killer case. Blairstown, New Jersey, not terribly far away. They believe that there's a connection to Long Island or to Ocean City. I think Ocean City is in Maryland. So in that general area, there are people that have also suggested that maybe this might be one of Joel Rifkin's earlier kills. That could make some sense. Joel Rifkin's a weird one for me because he doesn't seem to... He will confess to some things, but I also believe that he's holding a lot back. I think there's other people that he has killed and has held back that information and and chose not to confess to an extra murder or two than what we know him to be responsible for. Well, it makes sense if this victim is as young as 14. Right, and he's not willing to confess to certain things. So uh, do we have a, a situation where she's found in New Jersey and he doesn't want to be prosecuted or charged by a different jurisdiction than his other crimes took place. I have this, I'm not saying that, that I think that it's connected, but I have this nagging, sneaky, sneaking suspicion that, that Long Island serial killer, someone, some type of serial killer that was active in this general area, in this region, uh, you said region at one point or another is responsible for this princess doe. It could be, could be their first kill. 
or could be one of their earlier kills that's not been connected. The other thought, too, is that, and this is a strong theory in this case, is that whoever is responsible for this is already locked up for another crime, potentially another murder. Yeah, the problem with Rifkin, too, is, and, and again, he could have more more victims, but it seems like he didn't start killing until the late 80s, and obviously Princess Doe is an early 80s victim. On the Princess Doe website, the website dedicated to her case and to helping determine her identity, they got it. A couple of interesting pages on there, Captain. One is a theories page, and one is a, a questions and answers page. And I'm not going to go through everything on both of those pages because we've kind of discussed some of those just in in our general discussion here today. But some of the unsubstantiated prevailing theories in this case are, again, that she's a, a, a possible runaway that was known to have worked in Ocean City, Maryland. Again, this is inconclusive, but it's a it's a, a, a theory that remains strong to this day, at least amongst some. And there are other theories that she was uh, run away from Florida, estranged from her family. Again, this is based off of those eyewitness statements that came forward in 1983. There is ups unsubstantiated claims that maybe she was a local sex worker that worked at the truck stop uh, or at local businesses. Again, not confirmed, just a theory. This one seems interesting to me though. I, I tend to believe that she's probably not, does not have deep roots in this general area or any general area nearby where she was eventually found. I think if that were the case that we probably wouldn't be sitting here almost 40 years later, still wondering about the identity of our victim. And one of the questions on the website is who is currently handling this investigation and is it still active answer that they provide again, this would be from, I believe 2017. So we're going a little bit back here. But according to the information that they have on their site, Captain, it says the Warren County Prosecutor's Office is currently handling this case. And yes, the case is active and being investigated and pursued. Now, that would still coincide with the information that we found on the Warren County Prosecutor's Office website. And then a great question that is asked on this case, what forensic evidence is available? And the answer that they provide is hair, fingernails, fingerprints, DNA, and teeth have all been collected into evidence. The DNA has been entered into the nationwide CODIS database. One of the other questions that's interesting to me here, Captain, and I I referenced earlier that maybe this could be tied to a person who has killed other female victims, is the question that says, does the Princess Doe case have anything to do with the Tiger Lady? question mark. So the answer is the tiger lady, a, is a woman who is unidentified. A Bengal tattoo was found on her calf. Uh, so that is how she gets this name of the nickname of tiger lady. She was found nearby. Uh, I guess this is Knowlton township in 1991. Now law enforcement has stated that they do not believe that the cases are related but there is this strong suspicion because you have these two victims, yes, found, mind you, nine years apart, but relatively close to one another in the same county of Warren County, New Jersey, and we have two of them who are still unidentified. I think it's pretty simple to me. Again, if we could do some DNA testing and and connect her to a family, Mm -hmm. because the other problem, too, is the person that could identify her is possibly also the person responsible for her death. And that's why they haven't came, came forward to identify her. And, and that is my strong belief, my, my strong suspicion there. And I think you're exactly right here, captain. Let's get some DNA testing, some familial DNA, uh, genealogy work, detective work going on this. Look, there's, there's several 
agencies out there. There's several of these labs out there that, that can do all of this work in-house from start to finish for you. And we already referenced that this case is well known. You know, it's it's a it, it was known nationwide. HBO covered it. Uh, America's Most Wanted cover it. Several outlets have covered it over the years. And if you want to get your name in the papers for solving a big case and, and pointing out that, hey, this is a service and a technology that we offer that we can sell to people, this is a great way to get your name out there. And I'm hoping that there are these labs that are coming forward and offering their services to the great state of New Jersey. Now, from the Warren County prosecutor's office website. And I know that this is a problem in a lot of counties. We talked about this in our Sam Little case. We talked about it in our America's Highway Serial Killer cases that we covered, four-part series. But for Warren County, they seem to have a bit of a problem with unidentified remains. We know that they have Princess Doe, who was found July 15th, 1982 in Warren County, New Jersey found behind the Cedar Ridge Cemetery on Highway 94, located in Blairstown, New Jersey. We also referenced Tiger Lady, who was recently identified. And this is interesting too here, Captain, because this is a a laboratory that's more than capable of coming up with some answers in our Princess Doe case. So in July of 2021, Bodie Laboratories in Virginia was able to locate family members of the deceased victim known as Tiger Lady uh, using genealogy. The deceased female was positively identified as Wendy Louise Baker. Wendy Baker traveled through multiple states prior to being found in the gravel parking lot area along Route 94 in Knowlton Township, Warren County. I would like to know what states she was known to have been traveling through because I, I get it that it's nine years later, but is that the problem that we have in identifying princess doe? Was she from another state? Could she be from one of the states that Wendy Baker was known to have traveled through? And then in 2017, we had some human remains that were discovered by law enforcement as well. This was, freaky stuff here, man. The police responded to a call that somebody had discovered a shoe Mm -hmm. that still had a foot in it. So this was a woman's size seven Reebok sneaker Mm. that contained a gray colored crew sock and exposed lower leg bones was recovered by the, uh, sorry, recovered May 2017. And again, there's additional information on the Warren County prosecutors website. But what can we do other than shine some light on this case here in the garage? What, what, what we can do is share these images with people on social media, asking for help though. There'll, there'll be images on our website at truecrimegarage.com. And also, hopefully, we can put some pressure on law enforcement to do these tests to identify this victim. And hopefully, Bodie or somebody like Bodie Technologies, Bodie Laboratories, will reach out to Warren County and offer their services free of charge. And the captain's exactly right. We need to we need to share. We need to view and share the images of Princess Doe. But what's also very important is that we view, share, and review and share the information in Princess Doe's case. Because again, because of how badly this victim was beaten, we're, they're kind of guessing as to what she looked like. So that might be part of the problem too, just based off of, uh, off of looking at our victim or what she may have looked like. Nobody's connected any dots. I think that the information of the items, the clothing that was found on her, and where she was found, the time frame, all of that is just as important, if not might be more important in this case, than the actual composite sketches of Princess Doe. Now, if anybody does have any information out there, again, it's Warren County who is actively pursuing this case. So you're going to want to get in touch with the Warren County Prosecutor's Office 
and their phone number is 908-475-6275, or you can email at coldcase at co.warren.nj.us. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. We're excited to be heading down to Nashville. And you can hear all about it if you're subscribed to Off the Record. We'll be talking about it next week. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? Yes, we do, Captain. And that's right. Down in Nashville, we're going to turn that mother out. Mm -hmm. This week, we are recommending... Hide your children. (laughs) Hide your wife. This week, we are recommending Ruse, Lying the American Dream from Hollywood to Wall Street. This is a memoir from the man who lived this wild ride called his job just to get by and then to thrive. Robert Kerbeck's juicy memoir tells all and with a bit of a spy novel type of thrill. Kerbeck bears and shares all of his wild business secrets within the world of corporate espionage. Check out Ruse, Lying the American Dream by Robert Kerbeck. You can find that great title and many more wonderful recommendations on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. I want to thank you all for the continued support and make sure you share our show with your buddies on social media. It means a lot. Keeps the show plugging along until next week. Be good, be kind, and don't listen.